Hi, I'm Kara Swisher, Executive Editor of Recode. And I'm Lauren Good, Senior Tech Editor at The Verge. And you're listening to Two Embarrassed to Ask, coming to you from the Vox Media Podcast Network. This is a show where we answer all of your embarrassing questions about consumer tech. It could be anything, like, will the tech industry ever be able to solve its diversity problems? No. How do I protect my accounts and my identity online? You cannot. Kara's password is 12345. <laughs> it is not. Just telling everybody right now. Who will the new CEO of Uber be? Kara, me. I feel like you know. Is me. it you? It's me. Oh, they're getting the Finally. CEO they deserve. They do, exactly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some names. That's going to be fun. Heads. You and Francis Fry. Yeah, right. A <laughs> pair of you. Nice I, for me. Jeez. Why does Kara hate the Google bike so much? Oh, I just was at Google yesterday. We I talked about to... the bikes in our bike sharing podcast last week. We were there again, week. and they're still multicolored and irritating. I just get that irritated. Why are you so bothered by the Google I don't know, but I had the same, it was the same lizard feeling of wanting to destroy them. Anyway, so send us your questions. We do read them all. Find us on Twitter and tweet them to at Recoder to myself or Lauren with the hashtag Too Embarrassed. We also have an email address, Too Embarrassed at Recode.net. And just a friendly reminder that Embarrassed has two R's and two S's because we want to get your emails. Mm Mm-hmm. Today on Too Embarrassed to Ask, we're joined by two guests. First up is Matthew Prince, the CEO of Cloudflare, which is a content distribution network, and we'll talk about what that means. But if you've been following the news recently, you might know that Cloudflare publicly cut off its support for the neo-Nazi website, The Daily Stormer, after what happened in Charlottesville. And that was a more complicated and controversial decision than you might think. Matthew, welcome to Too Embarrassed to Ask. I'm happy to be here. We're also joined by the executive director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Cindy Cohen. She recently co-authored a blog post for the EFF, which criticized the moves being made by Cloudflare and other tech companies, saying that these are dangerous moves and that the precedents being set now can shift the justice of those removals. Cindy, welcome to the show and thank you for being here. Thank you. All right. So this is we're not we're trying to have too much of a debate here, but actually there's different points of view and it's been uh, in Silicon Valley, it's really been a big debate, and not just here with uh, with the firing of James Danmore at Google, all kinds of issues around free speech and the limits of it and, and other things. But let's first get to Cloudflare. Explain very briefly what you guys do, and then what prompted you to do this, to take this act? Sure. So Cloudflare isn't a household name. Mm-hmm. We no. run what is internet infrastructure at some level. Uh, we sit behind the scenes and make internet applications faster and we protect them from a wide range of cyber attacks. And our customers range from some of the biggest institutions in the world down to small businesses, um, individual blogs. Uh, And we see about 10% of all internet requests flow through our network. Uh, While we have just shy of 10 million customers, um, we see about 2.8 billion people go through our network. Um, you both have probably used our network hundreds of times in the last 24 hours. And we're, when we're doing our job, we, uh, you don't notice anything except for a slightly faster internet experience. What um, most of the content flows through our network is, is not anything controversial. But every once in a while, there are people who sign up for us, and we have a, a free version of the service. Uh, who sign up that are you know pretty vile and pretty repugnant, and the Daily Stormer was a uh, neo-Nazi website, and it had signed up for us quite some time ago. Um, you know we get twenty thousand new customers signing up every day, so it wasn't something that came on our radar until about three months ago. We became aware that people who were submitting abuse reports to us, uh, the way that we would handle that is pass them on to the host of uh, of the the content so that they could make a determination whether that had violated one of their principles or one of their rules. So you were taking a very hands-off approach. You would get these complaints and you yep. would say, we're not addressing them. We're giving them to the host site. Yeah. So what we had always thought is that True North for us was that, if you think about it from a perspective of like, like law enforcement, the job of law enforcement should be no harder because Cloudflare exists, but it shouldn't be easier either. We shouldn't be sort of a, a, a great system to be able to uh, add an additional point of control in mm-hmm. the network. And it's uh, it's important that, um, you know, we had said for quite some time that if we fire a customer, the content doesn't disappear from the Internet. It just becomes slower and a little bit more vulnerable to, to attacks. What was happening in the case of the Daily Stormer, though, was that they were doing something that we had actually never contemplated, which was just actually really pretty evil. They were going after the individuals that had submitted those complaints and harassing them, stalking them, 
um, uh, threatening them in various ways. And that was the point at which they got on my radar screen. And mm-hmm. So you've been contemplating for a while, because I think you wrote in a blog post that got a lot of attention, besides calling. Well, you wrote, we woke up in a bad mood and decided someone shouldn't be allowed on the Internet, and you cut them off. And then yep. you said, because I think he's an asshole. I yeah, think that's the word you use. Correct. Yeah, I, I um, you know, that was something that was in an email that um, that I sent to to our team, and and it was really um, at some level a change in our policy. Um, I think the the straw that was sort of the final straw for me was exactly a week ago. Um, I woke up and on Twitter there were screenshots of um, people who are on this site alleging that we supported them. And we actually um, that at this they said at the senior echelons of Cloudflare, you know, they're one of us, and that had just become a major distraction to us. And while we wanted to have a conversation about where the right place was for the internet to be regulated or content to be controlled, um, it, that was just getting lost in the noise of why do you support Nazis? And the reality was that, that we thought the content was absolutely repugnant, but we had traditionally thought that it wasn't the right place for us as an infrastructure company to be making choices on what content was allowed and not allowed online. And, uh, and so on Wednesday, um, you know, I think we deviated from our policy. And, um, you know, I, I think that that's the, the exception that proves how important it is for us to have, so, have conversations. So we're going to get to Cindy in a second about yeah. deviation, but what caused you to deviate suddenly? I woke up in a bad mood, and I was sick of these guys. And And to be um, clear, too, we're taping this on a Wednesday, but by the time you hear this podcast for our listeners, it might be a little bit after the fact. But you're saying this is exactly a week ago. From this point, you woke up and... And said, you know, we need to have a conversation about where the right place for regulation to happen is. Um, We can't start to have that conversation until we deal with this, this issue. But, you know, one of my favorite sayings is from a a, a former congressman from Oklahoma uh, named J.C. Watts, who said, you know, when you're explaining, you're losing. Um, We found ourselves getting calls from reporters saying, you know, why are you supporting the Daily Stormer? And we would say, well, you know, here's our position. You know, we think that it's important for us to be neutral. And people would say, oh, one of two things, either, you know, how can you support these? These are Nazis. And, And they'd write a story about how evil we were to support Nazis. Or they'd say, oh, that makes sense. And then they wouldn't write anything at all. And so what we weren't having was a public debate like we did internally. And we thought that that public debate was really important. And so, you know, I'm, I'm extremely happy that, you know, Cindy wrote what she wrote and that, that we're here talking about this. And I think it's an important issue that we need to think about as technology companies, but also as Internet consumers, content creators, regulators, law enforcement where is the right place in the infrastructure stack for editorial decisions right, to be made? So, Cindy, this is you were like, no, 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 no. A lot of them did it, not just Cloudflare, but GoDaddy, Google, the Google uh, refused Daily Stormer the as a Russians customer. Russians have now thrown uh, them off. Lots Facebook, of Discord, GoFundMe, they've all taken steps to ban na- white nationalist content. And your response has been, "This is I'm going to." Put words in your mouth. This is a slippery slope. I think it's really dangerous. It's not just a slippery slope that we're starting. It's a slippery slope we've been on for 17 years. The whole time I've been at EFF, I've been trying to help people who um, are trying to speak online, who face uh, people who don't come to them, but instead go upstream, who mm-hmm. go to their uh, uh, domain name host, try to get the whole domain thrown off, go up you know, uh, where Cloudflare sits, which is kind of in some ways a little to the side, but even higher in mm-hmm. the infrastructure, and try to silence p- voices they don't like. And the vast majority of those cases are not Nazis. Mm-hmm. Um, there Give was, us an example. There, well, we represented a group called the Yes Men. They're, uh, they're a, a parody group, and, and they did some, uh, some pointed political criticism of uh, De Beers Diamonds. Uh, they went upstream from um, the, the Chamber of Commerce lodged a complaint against them, went upstream and tried to get the yes men thrown offline. We've worked with activists who are active in the oil and gas uh, fights about where the drilling should happen. Again, uh, Shell Oil got mad at them, went upstream, got their website kicked off the internet for a while until we got it put back on again. So the moment where this is about Nazis, to me, is very kind of late in the conversation. And in some ways, um, not the best example, because the vast majority of these takedown requests, especially, again, I, I want to differentiate between kind of deep infrastructure companies and the frontline companies where that really have a direct relationship with their users, like the Facebook, Twitter, and those guys. It's, it's not that different, but I think it's very different once you start going up the chain, because uh, what they do is they take down the whole website. They can't just take down the whole, the, mm-hmm. the one uh, uh, the one 
you know, bad article, they take down the whole website. So the whole recode website comes down because you guys say something that, that pisses off some billionaire. Karen mm-hmm. never does that. It <laughs> never <laughs> happens, right? Uh, yeah. Um, but that's a very, very big tool. And that's why uh, these companies, including Matthews, have a right to decide who they're doing business with. But we urge them to be really, really cautious about this. And we need companies to think about this not as something they're doing in the one time because of a uh, you know, very public, uh, ugly, horrible speech. I have no love lost for the people at the Daily Stormer or any neo-Nazis. Um, but is this a tactic that we're willing to say is a good tactic because it's going after people we hate now? Because I can guarantee you that in the past and in the future, it will be used against causes that you love. So what is that like defending the Nazis? Because I think you know the ACLU <laughs> also had pushback from some of stoners and stuff like that what happens is it just you say the word neo-nazi and everyone's like okay let's go after that or what how do you how do you defend like what's it like well i don't defend them no Um, but what's it like having to defend that well or, or the principle well i think that if we if we don't believe in laws and processes um, and we throw them away every time somebody gets angry at us, we will end up on the backside of this. And as a Jew, uh, we've had our voices silenced over and over again in uh, through time. And the idea that there needs to be rule of law and careful processes and ability to make correction when you do the wrong thing is – as vital to voices uh, on all sides of this debate. That's why the First Amendment works the way it does. That's why the international rules about freedom of expression, you know, this this idea that freedom of expression is an American concept is not true. It's in all of the international covenants as well. Um, So the, you know, I have no love lost for these particular people. I don't believe that anybody should listen to them, that they, they deserve a platform. But I worry about endorsing a tactic at a time when, when our emotions are high, that that has been and will be used mm-hmm. against us, um, and you know, I I understand the people who can't hear very well what we're saying about the rule because Nazis make them so angry. I have a lot of sympathy for those folks, but I think that as somebody who cares about free speech online and who sees the vast majority of small powerless people who get to speak because the internet is an open platform far more than in regulated industries and um, other sorts of situations I want to protect that space um, and so you got to get you got to you know, be as angry as you want, but don't embrace a rule that's going to bite you. Talk about this idea of free speech, because both a lot of, of people, think- yeah, for both of you, they they sort of use that phrase a lot when they're talking about online content moderation, when in reality, a tech company is not beholden to a citizen the same way that a state or a government is in terms of protecting the freedom of speech. So where do you, I guess, Matthew, where do you draw the line? And, and Cindy, where, what do you see the responsibility of these tech companies being? So... You know, I think that there's a, a conversation that, that we need to have about when technology companies get to such s- scale that they effectively become the public square. And the in this case, the reality of publishing something on the Internet, if it's at all controversial, requires you at this point to have a network at a scale of Cloudflare's or Google's or Facebook's or, or Microsoft's that the the resources that to to just withstand the attacks and 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 hacking and everything that that tries to take you down. Um, if you don't have that, it's it's really difficult for you to be online at all. And so, you know, what I worry about, which I think echoes what Cindy worried worries about, is that there's a you know almost a cabal of effectively ten tech CEOs. And, and tech executives who are making decisions on what can and cannot be online. And, and those decisions are somewhat arbitrary. So in Google's case, Google stopped the Daily Stormer from using their registrar service. But Google runs a lot of other services. They have an ISP, mm-hmm. Google Fiber. They have a, a, a DNS service, Google DNS. They have a, a, you know, the, the market-dominant browser, Chrome. Uh, they have Search, Search. obviously. Yeah. And... Google didn't withdraw the Daily Stormer from any of those things. They could have at right. some point. They could take it out of search. I was thinking. They could take they it out of search. They technically can. Yeah. Yes. That, well, and they block things in Chrome all the time. Malware. You get mm-hmm. the sites mm-hmm. like, this is a dangerous site. Don't go to it. They can. They block stuff. They could porn, block stuff across um, filters. They could stop DNS requests. And yet they chose not to do that. 
I, I'm not saying that decision was 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 wrong. In fact, I, I if anything, I think that the decision to pull them from the registrar service uh, was, seems incredibly dangerous because, as Cindy said, that's an all or nothing decision. That's a global decision mm-hmm. that you're either on or off, and so that's a very dangerous point for place for content to be regulated. But but it does show that this is a nuanced conversation. You know, I analogize to a pre internet world where if you imagine that Ma Bell is listening in on your phone calls and decides at some point you're talking about something that doesn't serve either their political, moral, or economic interests, and they unplug you from the phone network, that, that, that doesn't feel right. I think we need to have a conversation about if we're going to regulate content online, where is the right place to regulate it? And, and, and I, you know, I'm the son of a journalist. I believe deeply in free speech. That's what we talked about around the dinner table. I think it's one of the things that makes this country so, so powerful. But it doesn't have the same force around the rest of the world. What does, on the other hand, is an idea of due process, an idea that there are a set of rules that you should follow and you should be able to know going into that. And I don't think that the tech industry has no, that set of due process. It's totally arbitrary. And, and we didn't follow principles of due process in this case. No, you just decided. You that's right. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that, again, I think we need to question, should that be something that we follow? And we need to have that public well, debate so who, and that who, conversation. Nobody can regulate these Company. Well, Who I would you to take you off search just because Larry Page thinks you're an asshole. Well, and if Larry Page woke up and said, I think they're assholes. I think I'll just remove them from search. He can do that. He can. And I think that that's one of the reasons why we need that. We do need to have the public conversation. I should give a small uh, clear, uh, just something for your listeners yeah. to know. EFF has represented Cloudflare in the mm-hmm. past. They fought a gag order and national security letter case for many years um, under seal and secret. We couldn't tell anybody mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. but recently been unsealed. I just pretty, want to be. Pretty, and pretty amazing. Like we, we got that order when we were a thirty-person company. What do they want? Um, records on customers, mm-hmm. um, and and again, we could not, with the resources that we, we making the decision that we were going to stand up and sue the federal government to protect what you know you could have looked at and said this is not a very nice customer, but but the process was wrong. We could not have done that without the EFF support. Yeah. So we. I just want to make sure you know Matthew and I. Um, I actually think Matthew did the wrong thing here, and but it sparked a really important conversation. But mm-hmm. we do have a, a, a relationship. Well, what would you have mm-hmm. had him do if he feels like this? Like, eh, I'm not going to help this guy. I- well, I I think it's not his decision. I really think the idea that the guy who rides the BART next to me is going to be able to tell all around the world mm-hmm. who's the good guys and who's the bad guys in all of these situations mm-hmm. is um, a fantasy. They're not going to be able to get it right. We have processes by which we put certain organizations um onto a sanctions list where companies cannot do business with them. You can't do business with the North, North Korean government. You can't do business with ISIS. There is a process by which you can put things beyond the pale. Um, I worry that that process gets misused too, but at least there's a process mm-hmm. there. It's not, you know, somebody had, you know, a, a stomach ache and decided to throw somebody off the internet. The internet is too important to be subject to the whims of this small group of people. They're going to get it wrong. They're going to get played. And I don't think that anybody should have that kind of power. That's what they, Matthew they said in his They are not post. public entity. I mean, wait, let, not. let me think about it. Like, I'm trying, this is like kind a of an utility idiot. company or, they're or not, like a government? They're government. beholden I mean, to what, nobody. Right. I mean, what, how do you think they should be regulated? Well, I don't know that they – I mean, I and think who that – can? Who yeah, can? I think that there is – there are again. There are uh, every most every country around the world has certain rules about uh, people who are North beyond Korea, the pale, right. North Korea, and all those kinds of things. Those kinds of things are very much um, present, and they're present, you know, uh, all around the world. And so I think that there there is a process by which that happens. You know, one of the things that's going on here is that the U.S. government is not stepping up and taking the steps that are within its power to try to rein in the actual violence on the ground Mm -hmm. that is happening. I mean, a woman got killed, people got beat up, and we are not seeing the actual forces in our society that are supposed to respond to those kinds of things responding. And so people are turning to the tech companies because maybe they'll do something. And I, I think that, you know, we're also turning to speech about 
violence rather because, well, because we're feeling helpless people, about the a lot violence of people do itself. get power and are amplified by social media they do start to attract people that show up at these things they organize but online. I but I think that if the people who were engaged in beating people up in Charlottesville the people who uh, were involved there were actually getting arrested and they were actually doing say the things that they do about gang violence mm-hmm. to some of these organized armed violent people people wouldn't feel such a pull to deal with the speech part of it right Right. it's i think that this is a byproduct of the hate not the hate itself and uh we're we're solving for the byproduct because it feels like that's someplace where where somebody can do something Mm -hmm. because the people who we've elected and are running not stopping the action are not stopping the actual (laughs) violence and i think that you can get distracted by that but i think that the focus ought to be back on the violence and you know whether you're talking about gang ordinances you're talking about you know weapons uh, rules which we have in some states different ones in different states if you're talking about those kinds of things and really being serious about enforcing them say as we are with things like gangs and things like criminal conspiracies um, you would see a lot less pressure on the companies to step in right, and fill you, this you, void you, you'd have to acknowledge though a lot of the organization happens online a lot of the social amplification I mean social media has become weaponized in many ways in the same way so they organize it's your Facebook and you're a Facebook man Manager who created some maybe the groups the groups thing and you see them using this your first instinct is you can't use this I didn't make this for you I didn't make it to do this or if you're at Twitter I, I can imagine well, the discussions I know the what happened within Twitter I know what happened within Facebook I've, I've been at dinner they're they're practically weeping that this is what's happened with their products so what sh- should they do nothing or what would you imagine they would do both of you why don't you first you and then you talk about it what it's also they- just worth quickly noting too that back in 2011 during the Arab Spring when social media was credited with a lot yes. of the uprising that happened there it, it was, was almost portrayed in a more positive light. It was. And this is a similar kind of thing in, in the sense of people just but using outcome. it as a tool to gather. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, look, all these tools that help people gather together can be used to do good things and can do bad things. The interstate highway can be used to make bank robbery a lot easier. It also <laughs> made it easier for us to go to here or to there. These kinds of systems that help people connect, help people talk to each other. I use the highways because mm-hmm. of traveling. Um, they, they always can be used for good and bad. So I think that these companies are, if they're going to decide, I think that I think that internet infrastructure companies are never going to have the structure or the ability, the deep infrastructure companies, to be able to not get played and to do this right. And they're always going to be running from headline to headline, and they're going to get it wrong. When you're talking about Twitter and Facebook, the people who were really direct user experiences, they're beginning to develop better tools, but they get it wrong. You know, mm-hmm. YouTube just started using their AI to try to identify extremist content. You know what they took down? War crimes investigators mm-hmm. who were who were putting together things for right. the, done, the war crimes all, all trial. They've had those problems. They all have those problems, and so it's why I, I really urge caution if they're going to go into this. And you know, we have some principles that uh, us that EFF plus a bunch of international organizations put together called the Manila Principles, which are about uh, when uh, intermediaries can be held responsible uh, for uh, speech of other people, um, and when they if they're going to get involved in taking this kind of stuff down, um, what are the processes that have to be placed? It looks like due process. It mm-hmm. looks like a lot of things that we have the government do before they're going to come after, come you. after you. And okay. and those kinds of systems are, are not in place right now. Right, you know, so Facebook just took down a whole bunch of, um, over the summer, uh, took down a whole bunch of, uh, of, of queer activists, right? Because they were keyword searching for dyke and fag, mm-hmm. because they were looking for evil speech, and they end up taking down good speech. I've worked with women for the entire seven years that I've been on at EFF, I've worked with women in breastfeeding forums yeah, that was who are trying country. to talk about latching on, who are mm-hmm. trying to show pictures of how to do this right. They consistently get flagged as mm-hmm. inappropriate or obscene or pornographic right. behavior. So I worry about trying to, to lodge this with these companies. They're going to get it wrong. They're going to overblock. Right now, all the incentives are towards taking things down, not towards taking them down. There's no due process. If you ever try to put something back up again, unless you're a celebrity, it's very hard to get them to reconsider a decision. Um, so we we have to, if we're gonna if we're gonna lodge this responsibility in the companies, and 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 I'm not saying they should do nothing, but I'm saying you have to take it on seriously. You have to build have in structures, real yeah. processes, and you have to stick to them. Okay, before we get to, do you regret doing this? Because you got fed it totally. Right? Like, could you regret having well, to write I, I, that blog I, I, post, or what no, do you no, do? No, 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 no. I mean, I, I, 
I'm confident we made the right decision in the short term. Mm-hmm. And you got because much Because we needed to have this yeah. conversation. Right. And we couldn't have this conversation right. until we made that determination. But it is the wrong decision in the long term. Okay. But And so what, what I, 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 echoing what Cindy said, infrastructure is never going to be the right place to make these sorts of editorial decisions. Mm-hmm. But we do need to draw distinctions between what the different layers in the tech stack are. And just because a Facebook or a Twitter is making editorial determinations on what can and cannot use their their platform, I'm not sure that a level three or an AT&T or a Cloudflare you? should be doing that. And we, and we need to have that public legitimacy where when the mob comes to level three and says, block this stuff, because they will, or when they come to Google and say, not just the registrar, but now search. block people from using it in search, block people from getting to it in Chrome, that we as a public, that, that you have to be able to go, whoa, 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 we had this conversation. There is sort of a social contract. It's creepy if Mob Bell is listening in on the phone calls and determining who can and cannot be online. Cloudflare made that mistake once. Let's not let them make it again. So, and I should, I want to add just one thing. We're talking about this as if the tech company CEOs or the tech companies are going to make this decision um, and it will just rest with them. And if you think that the governments of the world aren't going to notice that tech companies can and do exercise their right to yep. kick people off whenever they don't like them and they aren't going to show up with court orders, pressure, the ability to kick you out of their country and start getting you to implement things like, uh, you know, uh, th- th- things about whole groups of people. Um, if you think this is always going to be a private decision, you haven't been paying attention. The governments no, have been doing this for a long time. So you're going to end up with Tibetans not having a voice on, well, the, and, on and, the internet because the Chinese don't want them to. The Falun Gong, you're going to end up with, there are fights right now about Palestinians and Israelis because... Uh, you know, the people calling each other hate speech. There's there's fights about Ukrainian independence people, and the Russians will come and tell you that those people are Nazis. Some of them in, are. In Most of them are. In 2013, under the guidance of, of the EFF, we set down a transparency report that said how we interact with law enforcement. And we put some things in that, some bullet points of things we have never done. One of those was we've never taken down content due to political pressure. And we get political pressure all the time. We protect LGBT groups in the Middle East. We protect African journalists who are reporting on government co- corruption. We protect human rights workers in China. And there we're constantly getting requests to say, take that down. And it's been very powerful for us to be able to say, we have never done that. And we can't say that with the same force Mm -hmm. and conviction Mm -hmm. that we did uh, just a week ago. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is really risky. Whatever you think of Nazis, if you believe that there is going to be uh, an abuse of the regulatory power of technology companies by oppressive governments, by people who disagree with sort of transparency, Mm -hmm. um, then then we have to hold the line very clearly on on what can and cannot be done. Very quickly, how concerned are each of you about the dark web, the movement of some of this information to areas of the web where people maybe can't see it or find it as easily? I mean, one of the things that I asked Jack Dorsey a couple of weeks ago in a conversation that was largely about Square and the future of finance, but I did ask a couple questions about Twitter and their sort of unique struggles on that platform was about this idea of, you know, how much are you supposed to censor? How much are you supposed to regulate? And his answer, and I'm paraphrasing, and you should go watch the interview if you're interested, was about, he said, it's better that things are out in the open. It's better yeah. that things are transparent, that we can see what's happening. The best. How do you feel about that? Because there is a lot going on in the dark web, too, and there's movement now to the dark web yep. of things that were previously visible to all of us. Again, I, I think that the the best way to fight horrible speech is with good speech. And you know, if you look at there, there was there was a, a series of articles uh, about a week ago about in Germany um, neo Nazis marching, and for a long time, you know, the the it was how do you control the march, and towns flipped that on its head, and you know, created a system where they said for every mile or every every step that the Nazis take, we'll donate money to anti Nazi causes. 
I think that that's the right way to do that. And and we internally, when we see content or when we see things on our network that we find repugnant, if they if they pay us anything, and again, lots of most of the time they don't, but every once in a while someone will pay us something for it. What we do is we we very quietly turn around and we'll take that and work with people in our organization that feel feel important about it. And we'll take that money and donate it to causes that are directly opposite whatever the repugnant point of view is. And that seems like a much better way to, I think the idea that you can make censor thought goes away. What, what President Obama used to say, which I, I think it was, was so wise, was he'd say, you know, people learn to hate. And, you know, you don't, you're not born hating. Right. You that learn it. Nelson Mandela. It. And so, well, uh, well they quoted, quoted Mandela. I heard mm-hmm. it when, when Obama mm-hmm. said it. But um, if that's the case, then we can teach them how not to. But but again, that's that's not by driving it underground. That's by exposing it, pointing at it, laughing at it, and and parodying it, or 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 finding kind of counter speech to. Uh, so you. To so let me get this straight. You regret what you did. I am so happy that we're here today having this conversation. All right. Had we not <laughs> done what we did, we would not be having this conversation, and we would be. And so, at some point, we had to have this conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, I, I think it's the wrong policy, which is why we said very clearly, "This does not set a precedent." But we do want to have a conversation. And Will you, you sell your services to the Daily Stormer at yeah. some point in the future? You know, the Daily Stormer are. Um, there's there's a there's a group internally that said you know we didn't kick them off because of the speech we kicked them off because they were jerks and they were they were talking about how we supported them and they were abusing our abuse processes and they were harassing some of our staff and 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 I, I totally reserve yeah. the right to not do business with jerks I, I will say though I think that that's I, I don't totally believe that argument. No. Had this been a well, blog about, excuse. yeah, had this been a blog no, about cute kittens, said, yeah. like we would have cut them more slack. So yeah. you know, it, it's it's really hard in our position to divorce yourself from what. When oh no, you have I think really you cut them because they're Nazis. Do you regret, Cindy, that he did it or not? Well, I think that he did the wrong thing um, for the right reason. <laughs> for the right reason, and I also think that he did the wrong thing um, to start this conversation. I think that there was a that that. Um, that had they just continued, we wouldn't be here. You wouldn't have invited Matthew yeah. and I on the show to talk no, about true, free speech but there were on the a lot internet. Of people. It wasn't just Matthew's GoDaddy Google. But they, they, I think, yeah, and they, I think they that, didn't have the conversation though. Yeah, I mean, they just said they violated our terms of service. N- no comment. Right. Yeah. And I think that the way that 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 Cloudflare did that Matthew did this was in order to make sure that we didn't just slide past this moment and try to pretend like we were, you know, making the, you know, the. Bush v. Gore of censorship decisions, you know, we never cited ever again. Mm-hmm. Um, and but but actually had a conversation, and it brings in stuff that we've been doing for a while. As I said, we 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 put together these Manila principles, which is Manila because they were created in the Philippines in a conversation um, about when companies should be held liable for content, but also then what do the processes have to look like if a government's going to come to you and say take down this information what does that process have to look like what do you as the content provider have to do we've we've thought through some of this stuff they may not be done but th- this conversation is one that we've needed to have for a while um, you know, it's it's all well and good for these little company, you know, for, you know, the little, you know, oil activists who can call me and I can go and I can talk to their ISP and get them re- reserved. But that doesn't scale. Right. Mm-hmm. So um, and most of these decisions, I, I, I hear you that CEOs are starting to talk about this. But for most people who get disappeared off the Internet, who get censored, who get their websites taken away, those things happen completely in the dark. They're by low paid uh, employees all around the world. They've decision. got the. They've got yeah. Facebook has the equivalent of call centers all around the world where they give them a little handbook, and say go to it. And that's how most people get Take silenced. Yeah. And that problem, we shouldn't let the, this moment distract us from that problem. In the and, oh well, it's Nazi, so why not? Yeah, the Nazi exception. Like you know, there's a huge part of me that might be okay with that, but mm-hmm. I think that if we don't stand by our principles once, it's very hard to stand by them okay. the next time. All right. So in just a minute, we're going to take some questions from our readers and listeners, and Matthew and Cindy are going to answer them. But first, we're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. Kitchen. Thank you. Today's show is brought to you by Amazon Web Services. Developers love Docker containers because they give applications portability and consistency all the way from your laptop into production. Amazon EC2 container service from Amazon Web Services makes it easy to run Docker apps in the cloud. 
Deploying, operating, and scaling your infrastructure happens automatically with Amazon EC2 Container Service. Best of all, you only pay for the AWS compute and storage resources you use. With Amazon EC2 Container Service, you can focus on building apps, not managing your container infrastructure. Learn more at ecs.aws. We're back with Matthew Prince, the CEO of Cloudfare, and Sidney Cohen, the Executive Director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And we're going to take some questions from our readers and listeners. Lauren, would you like to read the first question? I'd be happy to. The first question is from Anshul Kapoor. I am Anshul on Twitter, who asks, does Cloudflare agree with its reputation of censor for internet after Daily Storm or shutdown? Where does it draw the line? Hashtag too embarrassed. Well, Anshul, I encourage you to go back and listen to the first 30 minutes of this mm-hmm. program. However, uh, let's address this again. Do you agree with the reputation that you are a company that now censors people? We took one site offline. We haven't taken a single other site offline. Uh, We're having this conversation, and I think out of this conversation hopefully comes a policy which has more legitimacy because it's been discussed not just inside the walls of Cloudflare, but publicly. And at the end of the day, that's transparency is really one of the key core principles of a system of due process. And so we think it's really important that we have this and that we debate it and we think about it. And, um, and, you know, I, I, won't, I won't be surprised if when we come out the other side of this, the, the right answer is still that for an infrastructure company like Cloudflare, being neutral to the content while still complying with the law is, is, is the right decision and the right policy for us. But people with cat pictures get a little more slack than Nazis, right? They did in this case. Yeah. Um, but I, I, hope, I hope that in the future, again, it doesn't matter if I'm a cat person or a dog person, um, you know, content flowing through our network, um, we should be neutral. As long as we stick into regular rules. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Next one. Bit. I can't pronounce it. Biction- it's like Biction- Bitcoinary. Bictionary. Does uh, Eastigo support regulating mm-hmm. companies like his as utilities? But let's have Cindy answers first mm-hmm. to stop people like himself from actions such as his own. So utilities, Cindy? Well, Everyone I d- in the Internet loves a government regulation. Yeah, well, Not. I think with the current government, no. Um, you have to be very careful what you might ask for, yeah. right? Um, yes, please come you know, on. we certainly agree on a, on a whole different area about network neutrality. We mm-hmm. think that uh, the FCC's rules for, you know, basically enforcing non-discrimination online mm-hmm. were good ones, and we're sad that they're under siege and, and going away right now. But in general, I, I, I don't think that... Uh, you know, uh, that that government regulation, um, except on the very outer boundaries, things like the sanctions list and stuff like that, Mm -hmm. um, is really the right way to go because I don't think that the government, um, certainly uh, right now, I wouldn't be comfortable with the decisions that the government would make. The thing, and the thing I would add is, what government? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we, we, uh, we operate in 70 different countries around the world. We have infrastructure. Uh, each of those different countries has different rules, and so you know that uh, it, it is it is it, it's probably one of the biggest realizations that I've had as Cloudflare has grown about how there really is a patchwork of different government regulation around the world, and we need to comply with those laws. But but I, I, but it, I think that saying you know this is a utility. If you do that in the United States, well, is it in Germany? And do you want to set that precedent? And, and how, how exactly does that work? I think the better answer is that companies should be transparent about the policies that they follow. They should comply with the laws in the, in the jurisdictions that they operate in. And that government should be very mindful of the places that they put in content controls such that they, they, they respect what the geographic boundaries are of where they have sovereignty. You know, the Chinese government has, has started to make a, a, a point that they have a sovereign right to be able to regulate networks inside China. Now, mm-hmm. you may agree with that or not agree with that. Um, I, what I think is really important, though, is that inherent in that argument has to mean that their regulations stop at their borders. Because if they go any further than China's laws spilling over into Thailand or Canada or, or Brazil is actually violating the sovereign rights of those various countries. And so if you do something like, say, someone can't register a domain, mm-hmm. that's all or, or nothing. Or download a VPN from yeah. the App Store. Right. right. That's right. all or nothing. Um, whereas if you, you know, I think that 
what we try very hard to do is that when we do have to comply with some regulation or some law, that that stays within the borders and it doesn't. You only leak do it out. there. Many companies struggle with this. Many it's companies. a hard problem. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and there's some bad there's some bad law. There was a Canadian Supreme Court decision recently called Equistec, where the Canadian government said that they had a right to demand that Google take down a website. I think it was a trademark infringement or something. All over the world, the European right to be forgotten. Um, mm -hmm. And the question about where those the things world? are going, you know, European right to be forgotten, famously created on the backs of some guy who got his picture taken in a Nazi uniform and mm -hmm. wanted it scoured off the Internet. Um, so, you know, a lot of these powers, you know, you have to worry. It's it's not just the U.S. government, which we might be nervous about right now, but it's a race to the bottom with the governments mm -hmm. around the world if we start – putting these infrastructure providers in the place where they're going to operate as choke points, um, you're going to very quickly find out that, you know, w women who aren't covered are not going to be okay on the internet because there's a country in the Middle East that doesn't think that anybody should Well, I think in that, that case, Google just blocked them in those countries, right? They do, but there's a question about now whether that's going to be okay or not, right? This is what the Equistec decision says. Right. The Canadian Supreme mm -hmm. Court the has Can said, we, we have the right in Canada to tell Google what they do everywhere. But they don't. Well, we'll do, that's a fight we'll I got to win first, yeah, right? We're, we're going to have. How can they compel Google to do that? We'll find them. Oh, you find. Oh, and they can't yeah. operate. In, yeah, can't I mean the fines. In the fines in 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 Europe under the right to be forgotten are tremendous. Mm -hmm. There's a percentage of your mm -hmm. your annual profit. GDPR. I mean, is I mean, if, if your listeners don't know what that acronym mm -hmm. stands for, and you're running any kind of technology company, you know, be afraid because that's coming for you again. There, there is a there is a uh, a, a thought for some time that you know the the U.S. regulated the internet. And the deal that the U.S. had with the rest of the world, with, with Europe in particular, was, mm -hmm. you know, don't mess with our tech companies. We'll keep buying your cars. Um, one of the consequences of the current administration pulling back from a lot of those, those negotiations yeah. and, and not engaging has been that Europe is now quite emboldened to say, well, actually, the way, you know, this, this First Amendment thing that you've got in the United States – that really doesn't seem like it makes sense to us. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should be the ones that are regulating the internet, and maybe we should take over that mantle. And that's um, that's that that is that is a, a significant risk. And what's mm -hmm. interesting is I think that there's a part of that that Europe is doing because they want they think that that's going to help them clamp down on the Facebooks or the Googles. I think that the likely outcome is actually the opposite of that. Facebook and Google and Cloudflare have the resources to, yeah, to figure fine. out all of yeah. the different regulatory framework. Some new startup that right. comes out of Europe that all of a sudden is like, well, now I have to figure this out, this out, this out. It's going to be impossible for them ever to get the scale and the momentum to be competitive. And so the, the laws that are, that are intended to, yeah. to sort of Well, that's take never down happened, that. yeah. Matthew. Yeah. That's never happened. Also, we invented the internet. They can't do that. <laughs> Next no, question uh, is from Ian Gertler, who asks, how are things going with Cloudflare's Project Galileo efforts, upping the marketing anti soon, hashtag to embarrass, hashtag cybersecurity, hashtag NGO. I love the use of, by the way, happy 10th birthday to the hashtag today oh. as we <laughs> tape this. Project Galileo. Talk briefly about that. Yeah, so Project Galileo um, came out in 2013 where we started to see that generally Cloudflare's business, you know, small companies would get small attacks, and so we would charge them a little bit of money, and big companies would get big attacks, and we'd charge them a lot of money. Um, but there was this group of organizations that were small organizations, largely nonprofits or small commercial entities, that would get massive cyber attacks launched against them. Um, it really came to my attention when a uh, I get a list of basically free customers that we'd kicked off our network the night before for violating some policy, usually because they'd come under some major attack. And I was looking down the list, and I was like, uh oh. And one of them, it, I looked it up. The site wasn't online anymore, but I looked it up. It was on Wikipedia. It turned out it was the largest independent newspaper in Ukraine covering the conflict in Crimea almost certainly came under attack by either Russian sympathizers or, or the Russian government itself, and it got knocked offline. And, you know, we've got some, you know, 20-year-old uh, SRE on our team who has to make a decision of, is this politically important or not? And that's just a responsibility that we can't, that we're not hiring, we don't, we can't require everyone on our, on our technical operations team to have a political science degree. And so we struggled with it. And one of the questions was, we don't like making determinations on what bad content is. And so we didn't want to make determinations on what 
good content, or in this case, uh, politically or artistically important content is the way that we phrased it. So we went out and we worked with over 100 different civil society organizations, the EFF is one, ACLU, Center for Democracy and Technology, Committee to Protect Journalists. All of them. Yeah, and we and tried to span the not only geographic boundaries, but political boundaries as well, like arguing for conservative groups. No, seriously, we really do want you to be on this committee to pick who is either politically or artistically important. And so now what Project, Project Galileo does is that if somebody submits something and says, listen, I'm under attack and I need help, um, we send it out to this committee of over 100 NGOs. And if any one of them says this meets the criteria of being a small commercial entity or a nonprofit, and we think it's worth keeping online, we extend our full enterprise class support to protect them. And the, you know, the again, the organizations that we protect as a result of that, I know, are the things that I'm just the most proud of in in Cloudflare, where it's, you know, LGBT groups in the Middle East, and you know, we we had these three African journalists who came into our office um, about a year and a half ago, and like one was from Angola, one was from um, uh, Ethiopia, and they wouldn't tell us where the third one was from because he was currently being hunted by death squads. And they're reporting on, on you know, corruption in the countries that, they're, that, they, that they work in. And they all came up to me. One guy had tears in his eyes and hugged me and said, we couldn't do what we do without you being there to protect us from the attacks that are there. So These are online attacks. Yeah. These are DDoS the, attacks that you're or, responding to. Or cyber or different cyber hacking attacks. Um, you know, we're we're really good at stopping these things and we have the resources to be able um, to do it. So in this case, you're responding to people who have been knocked off by some other third party yeah. and you have to figure out whether to reinstate them. And so you're going to this group of experts essentially that you've assembled groups and asking them to sort of vet the process. Did you go, like, with what you did with the Daily Stormer, um, you sort of took the initiative in this case. Yep. Did you go to that group and vet them through no, that same you process? Know, I, so that's one of the questions that we've that we've wondered is, do you assemble kind of a, a committee of, of elders that, that kind of can come in and say, you know, this is this content should be kicked offline, or or it shouldn't. I, I I think that there's there's one thing to say. Um, you know, again, I come from a, a perspective that more speech is good speech, and so in this case, we said, if every single, if any one of these organizations says that this is something worth protecting, we'll extend our full protection to it. If you flip that around and you say, when do we withdraw protection? The question is, what standard do you create? Does it is it if one, if I don't know, the Heritage so Institute presumably. says that, then you know, would you kick it off, or does it have to be unanimous that everyone says it? There's a part of me that says, why should we recreate a political institution when we already have right. governments and right. regulations and laws, and they're going to have more political legitimacy globally in each jurisdiction where those are than than any any you know committee of experts that we can assemble? And you would have said, keep them on if they had brought Daily Stormer to you, correct? I think we would have said it was a really dangerous thing for them to kick them off, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think right. that's right. I mean, we have a process, you know, in the real world for trying to get an injunction to stop mm -hmm. somebody from speaking, right? It's prior restraint. There's a process in the mm -hmm. law. You can get them. They are very, very hard to get, and they're very, very hard to get because we have 217 years of experience in this country that says when you stop, we try to stop somebody from speaking before they speak, that's one of the most dangerous things you can do. We wouldn't have a country if, you know, people couldn't voice radical ideas, uh, you know, and, and, and they had to go through a committee of experts before they got to go, a committee of experts or a committee of tech bros, yeah. it doesn't matter. If you yeah. have to go on bended knee in front of somebody before you get to speak, you're going to reduce the universe of ideas. And maybe you won't get some heinous ideas, but you might not get you know, the Nelson Mandela is able to speak Absolutely. either. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Huh? And that's why we have to listen to Donald and, and, Trump's tweets and every for, day. And it, just to be clear about Project Galileo. it's the right Galileo, thing to do. With Project Galileo, all of these sites could have signed up. What the committee, it, what anyone there is saying is, by the way, this is so important that don't just put them on the free version of your service. Give them the version of your service right, that people would pay millions right. of dollars a year for if they were a big financial institution or something else. And so for us, it's not the question of should they be honest or not. It's the question of do they get the are they do services? they get do they get right. you know what is 
hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars worth of service for free because they deserve, they, it. It, they deserve it. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, next question, I have both of you answers. It's from JK at Bis Marchiavelli. How do you feel about founders making unilateral decisions? How much input should investors and employees have in the decisions? Why don't you start, Cindy, and then Matthew? Well, I think we're starting to see employees in Silicon Valley oh, yeah. um, have, a, have a much bigger voice in these kinds of things, and I think that's good. I, I think that, um, you know, you're, you're spending your, your life at this mm -hmm. organization. You're trying to make it successful. You ought to also be able to have a, at least, you know, some version of a voice in, in, in some of these decisions. So I, I think it's good. I, I You know, again, I... I my problem is I'm not sure anybody should have this kind of power because it's too big a power. Investors, and so, you know how they go. Yeah, I mean, I just think that whether – or the mob mm -hmm. or the government. I think that these are – these are many of these decisions are decisions that really, except on the very outer edges, should not really be made by anybody. We, the answer to – you know, Louis wow. Brandeis said the answer to speech is more speech. Um, it's not silencing people, and and we don't do that because we like the speech. There's all sorts of awful speech that I would like to see gone. The Daily Stormers, you know, in my heart of hearts, the Daily Stormers included. We do it because if you set up that mechanism, um, again, we had 117 years of experience in this country. If you if you set up that mechanism, it will not only be used in the ways that you agree with. It will be used in the ways that you don't, and our political discourse and our our conversation as a country will shrink to just what those in power think are, poss are are right. And, you know, we already have enough power imbalances in this country. Powerful people have a bigger voice than less powerful people. I would like to keep the internet as one of the few places where people without power get to have a voice, right, too. Can I flip something on it? So what if, I'm certain Twitter has a contingency plan if Donald Trump crosses their line. There's a line they have, the TOS, you know, whatever it is. Would you defend that if, if he did? I know He knows just where that line is, or whoever tweets for him. What if that, like if a big thing happened like that, which could, one night it could be he confeffies it in the wrong way, confeffies it, in the, you know. <laughs> um, I think it would be the wrong decision for Twitter. I think it's within Twitter's what if he rights. Follows, uh, their, if they violates their, what is clearly in their TOS. Then I think it's within Twitter's right to do it, but it, it's just as I feel about mm -hmm. Matthew's decision. I don't think he, that it was outside of Cloudflare's um, right as a company, and I actually EFF spends a lot of time defending the idea that intermediaries should not be re held responsible for the speech that people make. There's a, a, a law that we love a lot called the Communications Decency Act, Section CDA 230. Which that is at real protects, risk right now. That it's a, which has a, a, an attack going on in Congress right now. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that Twitter has the right to kick off Donald Trump. I think it would be the wrong decision. If he violated. I think it would be the wrong decision. And, you know, I, I think – so we – I mean, we, we, we've thought about these issues for a long time, and these are really important. I think that there's been sort of a history in technology companies of wanting to hide from public policy mm -hmm. issues sometime. We, we really embraced them from the very beginning, and we really chose to publicly come out and talk about these issues to try and be as transparent as possible. Employees choose to come to work at Cloudflare thinking about this and these issues and they and they really like it and and internally again it wasn't there wasn't a whole mob saying we have to kick them off there was a really careful thoughtful conversation on like here's the pluses and the minuses and it was and it was thoughtful the I'll give you a, a really specific example about investors we at one point had a very big deal that we were that was all ready to get signed that would have been worth tens of millions of dollars to us and the organization that we were going to do this deal with came back and said, okay, but there's one other thing. You need to fire this one customer. And it was actually a Project Galileo customer, someone that the EFF had, uh, had referred to us, actually. And, um, and it was a big deal for us because it was if we did this, you know, back in the, this 2013, this was tens of millions of dollars. That was a, that's a lot of money still to us. That was a lot of money to us back then. And so we went to our board and we said, here's the situation. How should we help think about it? And I'm really proud that our board was extremely thoughtful about it. And at the end of the day said, we're playing this for the long term. We can't put ourselves in a position where any one organization can dictate who can and cannot use our service. We gave our word to the EFF, to Mozilla, to Project Galileo as a, as a concept that we would stand behind those people. And, even if that means that we're going to walk away from this deal, that that's the right. You can't decision. tell us who this was. Who that one? 
Uh, I can't tell you who it was. You tell me the organization they wanted off. I'm I, guess I it was can't. Him. I can't. I'd love. I'd love to. Some. It'll be great for the book someday. All right. Okay. <laughs> Last question. Right. Last question is from Cody Wilson. Cody, <laughs> by the way, is a well-known <laughs> and Cindy's laughing, uh, chuckling. I should say is a well-known uh, techno anarchist who founded Defense Distributed. It's a platform for open sourcing 3D printed guns. We've written about him before, and uh, he wanted to know: Will Matthew promise to never to act? unilaterally again no you know I, I I won't promise to do that but I but I hope that I won't ever have to do that again I, I don't think that's the right way for an infrastructure company like us to uh, to operate and um, and again I, I think that we've we, we've tried to sort of show how dangerous those decisions are when they're made you know by me or Mark or Jeff or Larry or anyone else that's that's out there, and um, and so you know I, I I I've learned enough through this that you'll be amazed at the sort of situations that you find yourself in, and um, and and so uh, you know what what I what I hope is that again with the policy that we come up with, it, we we create a social contract around what infrastructure companies like Cloudflare should do. And that when situations come up like this in the future, that we'll feel like people, that the conversation isn't, why do you support Nazis? The conversation is, oh, it's really awful that Nazis use your platform, but let's use real legal process in order to deal with this as opposed to, you know, just pressuring, you know, me or the company or, or if it's not us, Google or Facebook or, or GoDaddy or whoever. So you reserve the right to act unilaterally. <laughs> Sure. I mean, that's. I mean, yeah. I'm, at, at some. I, at, I mean, I, it would be. That's. That is. That is why the board. You know, of, yeah. of Cloudflare appoints me. That's. That's right. what the CEO um, ultimately does. There is a. There is a point at which my job is chief coin flipper, mm-hmm. where you know, dis- really hard decisions come up to us, and and the team says, I, we don't know if the answer is A or B, and somebody's got to make that call, and um, I, 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 I will make those calls. Um, and I think that people like Cindy should hold me account of, accountable for the calls that I make. So, Cindy, what are you going to do to stop them from flipping those coins in the way you don't like? Well, hopefully you'll call me and we can talk it through and we can be part of that. I should I should just point out the reason I chuckled is because EFF has filed amicus briefs in support of Cody in his case. And so – and we have a relationship with him and, and the, the – the, the, the cases that he's doing. And then, of course, there's Matthew, who's also a client. So I was kind of chuckling that yeah. I really can't throw a rock without no, meeting somebody that the EFF is. doesn't so. represent anybody. Right? So Any we, more of Cindy's clients. We, we could almost, so I just didn't, I didn't want anybody to misunderstand my chuckling. My chuckling was just the, the idea that, 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 you know, these conversations um, end up with um, lots of people who EFF has helped all, over the years. And yeah, you must have a fun holiday party. You have a good time. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and I mean, they're, they're, the EFF is such an important <laughs> organization. We know what we're doing next December. <laughs> I know, we're going to your holiday, holiday party. Actually, party. Yeah, they do have a fun holiday party, but it's, God, you know, it, it's so important. I'll bring my 3D printed weapon. It's so important what they do. And, and you know, if you do believe in in free speech and, 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 uh, and, and that the Internet should be open and transparent, parent, you know, supporting EFF in, in any ways you can is, is something that, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah, and often, you know, free speech is like this um, almost more than any other part of the Constitution, although I would say the Fourth Amendment as well, is that sometimes you have to support people doing things that you vehemently disagree with in yeah, order yeah, to uphold the, the principles. Um, and so the 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 you know, all of, you know, the amount of First Amendment law that you rely on right now that was mm-hmm. created by Larry Flint mm-hmm. is a huge amount. Yeah. Uh, so w- we end up in the American legal system, especially having situations um, that are the hard ones coming up in the court. And, and organizations like EFF will try to come in and talk about the principles at stake, um, not regardless of, but often uh, despite uh, some of the positions that are taken by the people in the in the case. So you really just don't like what you do, but you love it, right? So, I love what uh, I do. You. I get up happy yeah. every single day that I um, get to can, try to make the world better. Can I ask very briefly, just answer, what do you think about the Google firing of James Damore? Would you have done that? Quickly, very short. I don't know. I, I honestly am not up on, on the individual um, circumstances of, of that enough. I... I you know, it's it's what what's hard. What was hard in this case is that you know things can become such distractions internally sure. that you can't get work done, right. and and so sometimes you make decisions that are like, 
at some point we have to get work done again. And last word. Yeah, I think that it was a very, very hard decision. I do think that um, simply getting rid of somebody and firing somebody because of their political um, beliefs is it's wrong. Dangerous. It's actually illegal in the state of California. What he was doing was actually trying to talk about Google and how Google should be different. Mm-hmm. It, it was a slightly different situation. And there, I think, as an employer, um, Google has to think about what kind of environment it's creating. Yeah, it's a great case. Um, it's a great I case. think it's a, yeah, I think it's a really hard one, but mm-hmm. I, you know, because they interlap. You know, mm-hmm. They intertwine a lot. But in general, I think you, know, you should be able to work at a place and espouse um, political positions that are unpopular um, and, and not have that result in and yet, you, yep. you, you getting fired. And yet you mm-hmm. can be. But yeah, you can be. And, and every employer will tell you, you know, the need to create a safe work environment, um, a place Super that doesn't seeds. have, re- yeah. especially in sexual harassment issues, a, a, a work environment that feels open and free is a tremendous value as well. And so that's why I say it's a hard case. Hard okay, mm-hmm. great. This has been another fantastic episode. A really great of, episode. Of Too Embarrassed to Ask, Matthew. And Cindy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. If you all enjoyed this episode as much as we did, be sure to subscribe to our show and you can leave us a review at iTunes.com slash too embarrassed to ask. And we won't censor your review mm-hmm. unless it gets really inappropriate, well, in which case it might end up. It's out. <laughs> Let me just tell you. <laughs> out. Uh, but seriously, subscribe. You haven't read you, our reviews lately, have you? I make new letter decisions all the time and I enjoy it. Uh, but seriously, subscribe. If you do, you'll be the first to listen to new episodes every Friday or catch up on previous episodes where we answer all of the tech questions that our listeners have been too embarrassed to ask. And if you're not on Apple Podcasts, you can also subscribe on Spotify, Google Play Music, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And you can also just go to the website. Go to recode.net slash podcast and you can find all of our podcasts there. And while you're there, you should check out our other podcasts like Recode Decode, Recode Replay, Recode Media with Peter Kafka. The Verge also has a great podcast. It's called The Vergecast. You've probably heard of it. And it's hosted by Neelai Patel. So check that out, too. And don't forget to tweet your questions ahead of time to at Recode with the hashtag Too Embarrassed or email them to Too Embarrassed at Recode.net. And by the way, what's the EFF email that people, if they want to get in touch with you all? Well, we're EFF.org. Got it. Um, and there are plenty of opportunities there to support us. Or if you need legal help, it's info at EFF.org. And that's how we handle people who need assistance. Great. Thanks for listening. Thanks also to Beth O'Connell and our editor, Chris Basil. And thank you to our wonderful producer, Eric Johnson. We'll be back next week to answer more of the questions that you've been too embarrassed to ask, so tune in then. Hi, I'm Lauren Grush, space reporter for The Verge. I want to tell you about my new series, Spacecraft. As the daughter of two rocket scientists, I've been around space my whole life. But for the first time ever, I'm learning what it takes to train like an astronaut, from the physical demands of the job to trying on a Mars spacesuit. And then I'm going for a spin in zero gravity. Check out new episodes of Spacecraft on youtube.com slash The Verge and on our Verge Science Facebook page. 